So, hello, thank you for being here. You could be anywhere else, but you're not. And I appreciate that. Oh gosh, Blair. My name is Rocco, you might know me. Uh, I release some distributions with a lot of documentation, and it's a lot of work to uh, Anyway, it's a lot of work to maintain that. Uh, you are either CPAN authors, or you're thinking about becoming CPAN authors, or your family. Uh, you're not technical writers as far as I know. And we all hate writing documentation, but we realize that bad documentation is a real big problem, and we don't want to be part of that problem. If you happen to be a technical writer and you would like to work on some of my documentation, the Enlightened Pearl organization will um, will will pay you to do it, to make it sane. You might know something about the insanity of my docs. Uh, this talk is an examination of the frustrations of writing documentation. It's also an introduction to my module, Plot Plexus, which is not currently released, um, that will hopefully make it a little saner. So why does writing documentation suck? Well, here's an example. Let's say you write a nice small module that paints bike sheds. You've got a bike shed that you want painted, and you're a programmer, so you write a module to do it. Um, and it's, it may not be the perfect one, it may not do everything, but it does what you need, and you want to release it to CPAN. So you write some documentation, and it's great documentation because it's a very succinct, very focused module, does exactly what you need it to do, um, and you're really stoked. So you release it, and um, that's the end of it, right? You're, you're done with your module, and you bask in your success. Well, no. Actually, that's the beginning of things going wrong, because users will come out and start using your module and start complaining about what it doesn't do for them. So what you do is you go back and you, and you incorporate their feedback. You say, OK, I'll refactor it. I'll make it extensible. I'll make it so that if it doesn't do what everybody wants, at least they can make it do what they want. And then the documentation falls into ruin because it was one module or one class that does one thing. And now it's maybe three or four classes and the documentation for the, the methods and the attributes have shattered into many different places where nobody can find them. So what do you do? You might cross-reference the documentation, put it all in the base class, and then have the subclasses reference it, say, look here. You can write very short documentation that references long documentation. But that's frustrating, because you can never get a sort of holistic view of your documentation. It also sucks because you don't necessarily know what you're missing. Uh, there are unknown unknowns, as Donald Rumsfeld says. So what you might do is you might copy your documentation everywhere. And that sucks because you need to then propagate changes everywhere that you've copied it. And you need to do it manually. And you wouldn't do it with code. You'd abstract your code and reuse it, so why would you do it with documentation? So you could bite the bullet and just write great documentation. If you were a technical writer, that might be easy. But if you're not a technical writer like me, it's a lot of work. And it's not coding. It's doing something that you don't necessarily love. So you could just maintain the documentation sporadically. But that sucks because you get documentation rot. That's a moldy cupcake that is blown out. Um, and this actually is the, probably the worst option because your documentation might lead users to do things that just don't work. So you could avoid documentation altogether, which a lot of people do, which sucks. But it does suck less than having bad documentation. Um, and people who abuse Podweaver have probably the worst documentation. It's all boilerplate that says nothing. But it leads you into reading it for five minutes before you realize you're not going to get anything out of it. So more objectively, documentation sucks because it describes a moving target. We're encouraged to release early and release often, but then we're also encouraged to document our, our code. And we're documenting moving targets, so we have to make a lot of changes to our docs. Documentation is redundant. For example, you have code which tells the computer what to do, and documentation tell, documentations tells humans what the code is going to do. So now you've got two descriptions of the same sort of procedures. Essentially, documentation is describing a description, which is kind of boring. Once you've written the description, you've said it once, why say it again? Documentation is redundant for another reason, and that is because it repeats itself. 
And repetition, of course, is the mind killer. You wouldn't write code like this, which repeats in a naive way, and you'd probably fire someone if they wrote code like that. You'd much rather see just a loop that, that does it once. Um, then this kind of repetition happens with subclasses. You have, say, five or six bike shed painters that do the same thing, but they have a different color, or they're painting a different configuration of shed. But the documentation can't benefit from the same things that uh, the code can. Also, documentation is tightly coupled to the implementation. Either it's, it's correct, or it's not. If you make any semantic changes, any public changes to your code, you have to fix those bugs in the documentation, but there's no dependency information. So first you have to reread your docs to find out what you've broken. And you can't do that automatically. I mean, code is tested automatically, or at least it should be tested automatically. But documentation testing requires a human to read the code, read the documentation, and diff them you know, conceptually to, to find where they go wrong. And you know, how many times do you want to reread your documentation? You basically have to be doing it multiple times per release, once per change if you're conscientious, or once per release um, if you want to do a lot of work for you know, a day or two. So I'm trying to reduce the sucking, mostly by reducing redundancy. Uh, I'm doing four things. I'm adding inheritance to pod, and I'm allowing uh, documentation to reuse code as documentation examples. Um, I'm defining boilerplates that can be reused in multiple places, but don't necessarily get rendered where they're defined. And I've uh, added indexing and cross-referencing to pod, which is very important because documentation should be hypertext, not just static things. You know, documentation like um, code it doesn't exist in a vacuum, it's actually used by other things. So I'll start off with inheritance. It's very easy to inherit a lot of code. Extend the class, pull in some roles, and you get a whole raft of, of new public methods, perhaps. But you don't get any documentation for them, so now you have to document this new class, or one of the other options. So you can say this in Podplexus. You can say, uh, we're going to inherit this class's method documentation and the method name. So two lines pulls in reflex war reactives watch methods documentation into your new class. You can do it for uh, attributes as well. However, um, well, and you can you can inherit uh, documentation from anywhere because you're naming the class. It doesn't have to be a base class. Uh, this is useful for delegation where you might want to pull in a class that you're not inheriting but rather using. Uh, Podplexus automates this. That was a, the basic functionality. It then uses ClassMop and MooseMop, I think, to inspect classes, find cl uh, methods and attributes that aren't documented here, but find out where they are documented in the, the class hierarchy, and pull in the documentation from everywhere else. <coughs> uh, it, I did mention Moose. It does use Moose, but I'm not married to that idea. If it can be made class object system agnostic and just work for everyone, I don't want to exclude other frameworks, then please let me know. But I don't know the other frameworks, so I'm just focusing on Moose right now. Uh, it also includes augmentation. You can do before, after, but not around yet. It's still a new module, it's still an unreleased module. For example, here's a base class that defines um, an attribute, say doc suffix, and then describes it. This is the base class again. Uh, and it also includes uh, some boilerplate. The subclass can extend the base class and says, well, after we pull in this documentation, let's put this new paragraph at the end. So three lines of pod, you get the next three slides worth of documentation. This is what it was inherited from the base class. This is the boilerplate, which I hope you can't read. And this is what you actually typed. And once again, that comes from three lines of, of augmented, um, inherited uh, podplexes. You can include an example. You can say, this method's implementation uses PPI to find it, will be put as an example right there. So is indexable file is used by collect live files uh, to identify which ones are indexable. So uh, we can just, you know, if there's a, an example of its usage in the distribution. It can become an example for the documentation. This is great because code reuse is good. And we're now reusing code as documentation, so we get all the benefits there. 
Um, presumably the code is tested, so we've got examples that always work. Um, and whenever we edit the code, the examples are automatically reflecting the new code. Also, it can identify when you've refactored and changed the method name and say, it doesn't exist anymore, fix your dots. Boilerplates I mentioned. This is a boilerplate paragraph that all commands sort of include at the end of their descriptions. And basically what you do is you say, include the boilerplate here at the end of the description. Now you've got one standard paragraph that tells you if the description isn't good enough, because it's, um, you know, then it's a doc bug, and please submit a patch, or please let me know. Uh, you can include foreign documentation the same way. You can say, include this other section from this other place here in this new section, which is also useful for delegation. If you have um, an attribute called entity, and you want to include meta entities documentation from some other class, you can do that, and it won't. The difference between this and, and inherit is that inherit, inherits it as under the same name. This lets you change the name by defining a, an attribute container called weaver type and replacing the, the guts of it with someone else. We like coding, but we don't like documenting. Well, I don't like documenting anything. So if the documentation can be made more like code, maybe that's more fun, right? It's a theory, anyway. So, Podplex has templating. You may have seen some templates or some template variables in the previous examples. You can symbolically include section names, uh, package names, and do other things with them. So, when you change an attribute or a method name, it automatically fixes up the paragraph. You don't have to do a global replace. For example, here's a, the top example is Podplex, and the bottom is the resulting pod. You can say um, the section name, in, in the body of the uh, description, and it becomes the section name. And if you change the section name through refactoring, it automatically changes in the, in the body of the paragraph. So there's less hunting for things that need to change, less editing when you make changes. You basically, you work on the code and the documentation follows. You can also put code in templates because it's using template toolkit. It's also using it in the, the worst possible way. Every section is a new template and it gets evaluated every time you release or you build. Uh, I would love to speed it up. Uh, we'll probably add some sort of clever caching to it at some point, but if someone is inspired more than I am, help me out. So a base class can do something like this. And I'm going to just point. Uh, this is Podplex's matter base class. We say if the package is not the base class, let's call a class method on the class to find out what it's going to do, and then generate a different paragraph depending on its capabilities, using class methods to configure the class. So if we were to change the code so that the, the class behaved differently, the documentation would automatically reflect that. And here's some resulting documentation where we have inherited the, um, the documentation, this is all from the base class inherited, and then the base class says, okay, it's called the, the class method is top level, and it says, this particular instance doesn't, or instances of this will not behave that way. You make a change to it, and that paragraph will change. Um, right, conditional pod, that's what I was just saying. The cross references are very big. I like hypertext documentation. I've read some pretty bad docs that I've written some pretty bad docs that don't tell you where to look for more information on the concept. I'd like to avoid writing docs that bad in the future. There's the cross reference command. You might you might want to in a see also section put a number of these. You can do each one of them with just an xref command in Podplexus, and it will generate the link and some text around it to make it readable. You can also generate tables of contents, where in a base class you might say, list all the subclasses in your distribution that, that inherit from that base class. So if, you, if, if a reader looks at the base class, they'll know where to look for variations on the theme. Kind of like this, where you would create links to, to each place to look. But that's all done, all of those are done in one command, the table of contents command, saying, okay, generate a table of contents for all the modules that match this regular expression. So one line gives you uh, an index of things in your, in your 
distribution. I also want to do a, a proper index I submitted. Um, I submitted, well, uh, a pod HTML patch that got rejected uh, to add proper indexing to, to pod. So I'm going to do it myself because I don't like rejection. And actually, for some reason, I'm five minutes ahead. Every podplexus command is implemented as a new class. Uh, it's, they're kind of like plugins. The, uh, the class name is based on the command name, so podplexus can find it without keeping a list of what's available. Um, so if, if you want to add commands to it, you would just release your own classes and your own distributions to, to make new commands, kind of like this Zilla. I rehearsed this about five times in the past couple of days, and I was five minutes over, and I don't know what happened. I gave you a kick at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, we have plenty of time for questions. I, I take it it's designed just to uh, <coughs> basically, for each file it will produce, here is the output part, and don't yes. worry about how to then get that into the file specifically. Yes, uh, there's a, the, the GitHub project for it includes a Podweaver plugin to, to let Podweaver put the, file, the, the content wherever it needs to go. Right. There's a command line utility that I'm using for testing that just spews it to standard output. I would like to figure out how to turn that into a, a source filter, a, a make maker type source filter that copies the resulting pod expanded modules into the distribution directory where they get bundled up and released. Right. I, I've actually been thinking quite hard about how to do it for make maker. I like Okay. Um, I think um, the answer is you don't actually you don't put it into the .pm file. You create pod files? Initially. In the disk, you generate pod files. Okay. Right? Um, the reason for doing that is that that way you're not shipping modified .pm files, which has always been one. Of, it's always been something that made, that, that gives me the screaming heebies with this cell. Yeah, I know when people report problems with lines that don't exist. Mm -hmm. But assuming your pod is at the end of the file, which is no. All right. In this well, in, in pod, pod, pod weaver hates you if your pod isn't at the end of the file. It's going to hit me then. Yeah. Um, I, but my, my thought is, because not having the docs there in line with the PM files when you're actually looking at the code, uh, what you do is you ship the pod files in the disk, make making, you can supply a command that it filters files to as it copies them into um, BLIB. Okay. So you can use that copy command to then take the content of the doc pod file and replace the pod in the .pm file with the version from the .pod. Okay. So what's installed has the exact ship generated pod in it just in the .pm file, so you don't get the .pm versus pod dichotomy that confuses all sorts of things. Okay. But your disk tarball contains the original .pm files, which keeps to the CPAN standard of the unpacked disk should look like what was in the repository enough that if the repository got destroyed by a fire, um, you'd still be able to carry on maintaining the disk from a table. It helps the it helps Squirm, who's, who's mirroring CPAN on GitHub as well. Right. Um, but still means that what's installed just has a .pm file with the generated pod. I'm pretty sure that the necessary um, stuff to do that would be two or three lines. Okay. It's just Podplexus wasn't, not sorry, Podweaver wasn't doing really anything interesting enough for me, mm -hmm. for me to get them to experiment in it. Okay. Um, but what? if you want to be able to integrate this with Play Maker, I'm quite happy to have a chat about it and we'll see if my idea does work as well as I think it does when we implement it. Okay. In, in my case, it would have, include two copies of the documentation, or I could have Podplexus filter the documentation out of this, the original locations leaving blank lines so that at least the code is in the same place. Mm. Yeah. I'm, yeah I'm, I'm not sure how to deal with interleaved pod when you regenerate part of it. Well, that's, that's... Poorly, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, well, so. I have to direct it. 
Okay. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's possible. Can I just get some? Sure. Sorry. It's all right. 